Are there beautiful people? I've decided to bring back a guest I had on just last month to continue a part two version of our conversation where we're going to dip into conversation topics like manifesting. We're going to go deeper on Dr. Joe. I'm going to talk about some evolutionary alignment, sound healing. Maybe we'll chat about some EMF stuff. And I've even got some notes down here about intermittent fasting and water fasting. So I might see where Sharon's at with some of that stuff. So welcome to this episode of the Life Masterclass podcast series, coming to you all the way from beautiful Bali. And as I look outside my window, it is a beautiful day here. Um, my guest is coming from Florida on the other side of the planet. Um, right. We're, we're going to keep things as practical as possible. And that's what we aim to do here with this podcast series. And, you know, both myself and Sharon that you'll be introduced to shortly are in this coaching space, working with people. Uh, and I love these conversations about what do you use? What tools do you use to get the best out of yourself and your clients? So our last podcast, we talked around Dr. Joe Dispenza and meditations. We talked around rituals. We talked around tapping emotional freedom technique. We talked about um, Wim Hof method, Ekadasi, like a traditional yogic kriya. Sharon talked about the Sedona method, talked about biofield tuning. So if you're interested in that, make sure you check out the, the other podcasts we did so you can find out about this. So I just thought at the end of that podcast, there was still a little bit more conversation piece about some other tools and tips and strategies that we use on ourselves and also on our clients. So welcome back, Sharon. How are you on this beautiful day? Fantastic. Thanks, Carl. <laughs> Good to be back with you. So, so briefly, can you give a brief summary of of who you are in in a few minutes or so? And if people want a longer version, they go to the other podcast. Yeah, people probably won't go back and listen to the beginning of that <laughs> one just to find this out. So I'll make it convenient. Yeah, I found my love of this work coaching back when I was an employee at Microsoft and in the leadership programs there, and I was a recipient mostly of this coaching for several years and also involved in the mentor mentee program there as well. And it took me a while to realize that that was my favorite part of the job. And then it took me a little while longer to realize that I could do that and I could make this more of my life. And when I left there, I continued my training, traveling the world, finding interesting teachers and putting this stuff into practice, both in my own life and with clients for the last several years. So um, all that has taken me around the world several times. I currently split my time between the mountains of Colorado and the golf courses of Florida, and hopefully soon to be back <laughs> in beautiful Bali as well. And that's where, that's where Sharon and I connected, was in Bali and that sort of thing. So yeah, hopefully at some time in the not too distant future, we'll be able to high five in person yeah. and continue these conversations. <clears throat> now, if you're watching this on YouTube, like the video, I've got some red, looks like rouge here. Like I was talking to Sharon before the show to like get some ideas. Maybe there's some essential oils I can put on it. I'm going to go for a massage today because I live in Bali and we get awesome massages for very little. I might get a bit of a facial done as well. Like just So when we talk about <laughs> things to do for ourselves, I'm very much about... You know, what can we physically do on ourselves? And I was talking to Sharon again before this about working on layers. So it's like if if I'm feeling off, the first thing I do might be to look at is there anything in my external environment that's contributing to me having this internal environment experience? And I change as much as I can do. There's certain things I can control influence, some I can't. Then I bring the attention inwards and do this inner work. And that's going to be a, a big part of the conversation today because one of the things I want to ask Sharon about, we talked about Dr. Joe Dispenza last time. And if anyone doesn't know his work, dive into his work. We suggested the best book maybe to get started is You Are the Placebo. Um, that will get you into it. And then if you can do any of his workshops, you know, do yourself a huge favour and get along. They're actually not that expensive. And I remember the first time I did it, I said to myself after an activity on the second day, I said, and this was like a five to seven day event. I said, I've got my money's worth already. 
the experience I had doing a particular activity was so profound to me. I said, you know, thank you very much. You know, I've already got my money's worth. So again, it's like amazing stuff and it really isn't that expensive in the bigger scheme of things. And what you learn on that and take away from that, you can take into your life and, you know, reuse and reuse and reuse time and time again. So Sharon, you know, had the the joy of going to an advanced um, workshop of Dr. Joe's. And I'm very curious myself, you know, to hear about that experience. So, you know, let's let Sharon share with us what she got out of that new distinction. Last time, last time we spoke, I, I had just gotten finished with a week-long retreat in Cancun. And since then, I got to attend what he calls the advanced follow-up retreat, which was a three and a half day event. And then happened to be in Denver, not far from where I was at the time. And this is my first time going to that shorter format. And it's with students who have already been to the week long retreat. So we're able to dive right in and we are all presumably daily practitioners of the work and understand the fundamentals. And so we can get right into it. And I, had some really cool takeaways. I didn't feel as much as the energy moving as I did at the week long back in Cancun in December, but that didn't matter. I came out of there with, the other day we were taking a shuttle down from the mountains down to the airport and it was moving around on the road and I was towards the back of the van and I was feeling all these gyrations for the last couple of years or a couple of decades, I've been experiencing motion sickness and I'm sitting there going, okay, it's going to come on any moment. And I just realized that the whole time, and then there was the smell of fumes, which yeah. also tends to bring on that motion sickness feeling, the nausea yeah. feeling, none of it. And I was in that shuttle for an hour and 45 minutes going, oh, this healed. And it was something I wasn't even working on healing. And I find the more I'm doing this kind of work, the more I have surprises like that, this thing healed, this thing healed. And as he says, that's a part of my old personality. Mm. I've changed in the way I respond to life emotionally. The same triggers aren't there and therefore the same physical ailments aren't there either. And so I was like, oh man, I just came out of this retreat and it was so serene. It was so beautiful. It was much more just mellow than my experience in Cancun where I had a ton of energy moving and all these moments of like, okay, that was definitely it. I just had a, had a healing come through there. My autonomic nervous system was getting reset. This one um, had just some beautiful reminders that I took away of experiencing life with more joy, more curiosity, more pleasure. And which is something I've been focusing on for years anyway. And to bring it to a deeper level, he reminded us that if some, if we're feeling frustrated in some of the meditations and it seems like nothing's happening well i'm just not that good at it yet it's keep practicing yeah. it's practice every moment of this is practice and it's not necessarily about getting an outcome especially getting an outcome getting a, a movement of energy in that meditation it's about who we become in the process mm. and that's the lasting thing in mm. life there's many times where we can get what we want but did we really change? Did we really learn anything? Are we going to find ourselves in a very similar situation again yeah. and repeatedly throughout life? And so I really, those things landed with me. And so I kept telling myself every time I was finding myself thinking too much or being frustrated, it's just practice. Nothing serious is happening here. <laughs> find the pleasure in this moment rather than waiting to have the pleasure once the outcome is achieved. Yeah. And so those were some of my just peaceful experiences in this short short weekend. I don't know what can happen. I love that idea that um, working on something, you think you're working on something and then these, these periphery um, bad <laughs> products of it. And that makes sense to me. It, it's like, you know, the, the body has this intelligence, the mind has this intelligence, consciousness has this intelligence where it can get the general idea of what you're doing here and it sort of can package that stuff up. It's not like you need to remember every single piece. It's like there is this innate intelligence. It's like 
Okay, it's time to evolve beyond this thing. We've got you know better coping mechanisms or this doesn't need to be a bother or whatever. And these things get picked up along the way. So again, yeah. I like this idea of the, the broader perspective of it and doing it you know, might be for this benefit, but acknowledging that all things shift. And my thinking and believing is as we raise our level of consciousness, everything shifts. Like if we raise our level of consciousness, our relationships shift as well because we're sort of coming at them from a new place and space. So those things will happen. The other thing yes. you're making the point there about this idea of getting in the habit of showing up and doing that persistent, consistent work, I think that's the biggest challenge I have with my clients is getting them to commit to those practices even when they don't get immediate gratification and right. feedback on that. I'll, I'll get your take on it. My take and my experience with my clients is I'm a big fan of daily rituals and morning rituals and my meditations, my energization exercise and that sort of thing. What I tell my clients and, you know, when I get them to practice these things through my programs, you know, once they get to a point where they start feeling the benefits and maybe they feel the benefits over a period of time and they're starting to feel that, yeah, I'm... I'm feeling much better what can happen at that point is i'm feeling good so therefore i don't need to do this mundane basic stuff over here that i'm not getting immediate gratification on and so they start to you know waver on their daily practice of meditation their daily movement what they're putting into their body what they're listening to and i tell them once you stop doing these daily habits and rituals that's the first day of the backward slide in this thing so what's your experience with that and also what's your what's your methodology for getting people to commit to those daily practices yeah I find what you described there I've experienced that in my own life I shared a little bit about that in the last video and I love the saying it worked. So I stopped doing it. That's, that's what happens. <laughs> it sounds silly when we put it that way, but that's exactly <laughs> what's happening. And I've also experienced this happening with clients as well. And the way I like to encourage them and invite them to get ahead of that is to keep a track of gains, keep a log of what does improve in their life and it can be the smallest thing or it can be like a healing like a healing of emotion sickness that's been there for two decades yeah. right that's a pretty big pretty significant mm. shift and i i encourage people to to do that to keep that on our, their own and every time we meet i ask what are your gains for this last week or since we last talked and that starts the habit and then there's so much joy in sharing that with me or somebody else that they can share that with too, that it, it helps reinforce that behavior. And I also explain that the mind is a problem solving machine. So it can often forget the progress that's been made mm. because it's always looking at what the next problem is. And there is always going to be another problem, another challenge to solve. Yeah. There's always going to be something that it's saying, well, this can be better in your life. This can be healed. This isn't perfect about you. And so it's, it's naturally going to forget what improved. And then that's when we go ah, this work isn't working anyway. It's not worth it to wake up an extra hour early before work to do this stuff. I'd rather just hit the snooze button or I'd rather just go out late and stay out later because this stuff isn't really working. Nothing's changed when in actuality, so much has changed. It's just easy to forget that. So keeping track of that, I find is incredibly inspiring. Yeah. In my own life, that's what I do, and and I pass it along to my clients as well. Yeah, I like that terminology, tracking the gains. I might sort of bring it into asking that question that way. I mean, the challenge is um, if someone plateaus as well, so doing the work. So at times when someone's you know relatively new to the personal development work, they can have pretty massive shifts, yes. and I see that with my clients. I do a nine-month program with a group. 
you know, these massive shifts at the front end, and I noticed they're more likely to happen in someone who's pretty new to doing the yes. deep inner work. It's for me, it's like betting in those um, habits that you know that are going to serve you over the you know the life term. Right. Um, really embedding those in so they become sort of non-negotiables and it becomes uh, – it's so ingrained into lower brain and, you know, that's where habit is established, is a build. It's not frontal cortex, frontal lobe. I don't have to convince myself with willpower that I need to do this thing. So, right. again, this idea of, you know, finding these specific rituals that have the biggest return on investment – and doing those, you know, day in and day out, regardless of how you feel and regardless you know, how you feel before it and regardless of how you feel after it, like zero right. judgment to it. And I think that's the challenge for people meditating who might have some sort of experiences in the front end and then sort of don't have the same sort of in inverted commas highs from that experience so then like again yeah. questioning the benefit of it that's that reminds me of another realization i had for myself at the retreat last weekend and that was i get frustrated like nothing seemed to happen in the meditation and then i'd say you know what when i'm at home i'd say one in eight of my meditations is pretty spectacular and then some are mediocre and the majority are kind of like eh, nothing. I was thinking a lot. I might've fallen <laughs> asleep a little bit, but my life is incredible from that. And I'm still practicing. So this idea that I'm, when I'm at the retreat, like, Oh, that was a waste. That when nothing happened, I'm wasting my time. I'm only here for three and a half days. I was like, who knows? Yeah. Who knows what's actually happening Yeah. Um, in this practice of, and settling the mind down he says each time you catch yourself thinking and you come back to following the instructions you're breaking those old neural connections and you're re-establishing new ones and that takes time you got to cut you got to re-establish you got to cut out the old ones and re-establish over and over and far over and again why, far and why far and why yep yeah. exactly and when i hear that i remember okay it's not a bad thing to be thinking I, that once I catch it, I'm doing the work. I'm, yeah. I'm bringing in the new thought patterns yeah. and the new habits. And that's how this, my, my personality and my personal reality, as he says, will change from the old self to the new self. And it's not usually in some like magic yeah. burst of energy that yeah. flows through. It's in these, these small bits that all add up over time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's going to take us to another subject. I talk about that alignment thing. The other one I was just going to add to that was I did Holosync um, sound technology. So it's listening to specific stuff. You have to wear headphones because the sounds come in at slightly different hertz and the brain balances it out. So listening to these sound technologies um, creates sort of this coherence between the brain um, mm -hmm. hemispheres mm -hmm. and puts us into do different states of consciousness. What they did one time was they had a group, had them all hooked up to EEGs, put them through, um, what's the name, listening to their Holosync sound technology. And at the end, the story the, the, um, the guy was telling was a woman came up and said, oh, you're going to have to throw my results out. You know, I had so much monkey mind going on. I was just right. all over the place and that sort of thing. And they said, well, that's surprising because you had the most coherence out of anyone in the group. <laughs> <laughs> so that for me just blew out of the water any analysis, thoughting on my part on whether it was a good massage, a good massage. Sorry, I've got <laughs> massage on my mind because I've got a massage book for a couple of hours. <laughs> whether it's a good meditation or not a good meditation. So again, if that's a takeaway um, for you listening, this idea of don't judge the meditation, like get in the habit of showing up you know, doing that stuff and trust that just layer by layer, you know, this stuff is building up, firing and wiring those neurons, you know, that's building up new neural pathways, new ways of thinking, deconstructing some of your established past beliefs, re-establishing new beliefs, 
And Joe Dispenza's work is, you know, practicing these elevated emotional states. So you practice things to get better at them. So the more you practice these elevated emotional states of joy, of love, of awe, of wonder, of abundance, the more you're able to tap into and turn on those emotions consciously if you choose to experience that emotion over something else that might be in inverted commas, um, you know, a survival emotional state or a lower emotional state. That's right. That's my little it riff there. about practicing it in this waking state, not just in the meditations or not just when you're on a coaching call with your coach. It's yes. going back to what you're asking about clients being successful with this work is that reminder to themselves that they're catching those thoughts and bringing up the elevated emotion that they want to feel instead during their daily mm. life. Mm. That's the practice. And that in this time around, as I shared last time, I had been into the work of Dr. Joe Dispenza five, six years ago, had kind of left it by the wayside, doing it here and there a little bit. And then about five, six months ago, reimmerse myself in it. And this time around, I'm also much more engaged in practicing it in as I go through daily life. And I'm finding a lot more increased benefit from that as well. And yeah. I share that takeaway with my clients with any of the work we're practicing, whether it's Sedona method or, or these meditation practices. Yeah. It's about, it's about lifestyle. Mm. Yeah. That's more of what I do with my clients these days is yeah. I focus on lifestyle as opposed to folks on making lots of money or getting this promotion or whatever it is. What is the lifestyle that you want to have? Like what, mm -hmm. what are the emotions you want to experience? What are the experiences you want to experience? And let's work on lifestyle and let's build around that, cut away the things that aren't supporting that. There was I bet they find that it's a lot more achievable than they were thinking by the route that they thought they needed to take to get there. It's a lot closer yeah, than they that, thought, right? You're just saying the route that they thought they needed to take it, like that is so, when someone steps back and takes ownership, you know, of the, the ship of their life and decides, okay, I've been following some pathway from someone else. And that's what what a lot of what we do with the coaching thing is actually bring someone back to center. And that's why I was talking about this thing of alignment and like helping someone come back to alignment with their values, alignment with their divine path, purpose, calling, um, their dharmic path, if you're using yogic terminology. But, you know, I've got this belief that everyone's got this, you know, divine purpose. They've got this individual signature. I say... In all my workshops, hold your finger up in the air, like turn your finger around to yourself, your little pointing finger, look at the top part of that pointing finger and realize that you've got a unique fingerprint on, you know, 7 billion people on the planet. So if mm -hmm. that incy wincy tiny little part of you is unique, the whole package is is just you. There's There's nothing quite like you. You're this you know, individual little signature on this, in this whole universe. So, you know, special, special, special. So bring it back in, like, what is it? That is your individual signature. What is it that you want to express within yourself and, you know, in service to humanity or, or your own growth and that sort of thing? I was just thinking whether to, you know, continue down that path. There was one, one thing that... Um, a colleague of ours who attended the event um, with Sharon, she sent a thing to me, like just a message to me. She goes, you're going to love this distinction that Dr. Joe made um, in, the, in the workshop. And that was this idea, and I've just written a blog post about it, so we're going to put the link down below so you can check out my take on this um, intention. And it was over intent becomes trying so over intent becomes trying which is a form of separation and over surrender becomes giving up and i just love that because it's you know if we're at either end of the spectrum and sharon and i were talking um before this call about electromagnetic frequencies and you know 
what we choose to do around that and what that conversation means to us. And we talked about, Sharon talked about, you know, reading a book, Invisible Rainbow, years ago, and I've read the same book, and it's pretty heavy on the, you know, consequences of us not paying attention to and taking care of electromagnetic frequencies. And Sharon was sharing the story about going completely extreme, not only for herself, but for her parents and that sort of stuff. So this idea of like going too extreme, and I'm a big fan of there being, you know, spectrums and there's extremes at either end of the spectrum and in the middle there's a sweet spot and it's, you know, the Buddhist middle way, but not only just staying in the middle, which is pretty intense of itself if we just try to keep in the middle, because life is like, you know, more complex than that and sometimes we need to expand to either ends of that spectrum so there might be times where we need to be super intense on something to get something done and then we need to come back to the middle and sort of come back into this stasis point then we need to go to the other end of the spectrum which means super put your feet up but joe's dr joe's distinction here is saying you know doing either of those too much over intense which means over desiring and like i really really want this in coaching, I'm sure Sharon's heard the terminology, needy is creepy. So this <laughs> idea of if we get too needy, like if I get too needy of a potential client, I'm like, oh, you need to work with me. I'm just going to repel them. Like they're not going to, they're going to decide that you need me more than I need you as a coach. So I'm, I'm leaving. So that idea of like, you know, trying too hard. We all know like examples of people who try too hard to be friendly or try too hard to be nice or try too hard to get something out of us. So that's at one end of the spectrum and then that over-surrendering. So, you know, in my blog post I talk about this idea of the law of attraction where I just, you know, plant the seeds and I see the vision and then I put my feet up. So again, that idea of like we need to actually interact you know, with this three-dimensional physical experience. So it's like we don't want to just do all the the blissing out work and staying in those meditations. And Sharon said, you know, this, how do we bring that into life? So what was your take when you heard that sort of distinction from Dr. Joe Sharon? And what would you add to that? Yeah, that was a great quote when he said that it stood out to me as well so I'm glad she shared that with you it was I think I've been having a lot of conversations with my clients lately about the difference between wanting and allowing things to happen in life Mm -hmm. and and there's this energy of wanting there's this neediness of wanting. And when we talked last time, we talked about Dr. David Hawkins and power versus force. And I'm sharing the concepts of going through life with power, with flow Mm. and being in, in the moment and able to receive, because when we're forcing something and we're, we feel so separate from the thing that we want, we are becoming myopic and missing plenty of opportunities that are right here, right now that are on that path or something better. I love when I'm setting goals and when clients are setting goals, always add or something better Mm. at the end of the goal, Mm. because we can only think to the capacity of the experiences that we've had in our life, the things that we've learned, the things we've read about, the things we've heard from other people. And that's as big as we can think Mm. and dream. And when we're open to the power that's beyond us we can go beyond what we what our thinking mind can come up with and we can be open to seeing those things when they come to us mm. so where did we start i got so excited about that no 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 <laughs> that's, that's cool it's like over intenting thing the other one was the, oh the right other, right yeah surrender so, so it was a- yeah. It was especially that part because that's what I encounter mostly, especially working with the clients I work with that come from corporate or are entrepreneurs or um, run their own own companies. Yeah. And there's a lot of intent and there's a lot of big goals and there's a lot of striving and trying and 
you mentioned willpower earlier, and a lot of that takes willpower. That's not what people want to be doing, but they want the outcome. And they think that, again, it needs to go in these certain steps. And they're, um, and I, when they, when I invite them to notice the wanting and to let go of the wanting, they think I'm telling them to go to over surrendering. Yeah. Yeah. to apathy, to giving up. Yeah. But that's, as you said, there's a huge spectrum. So letting go of the wanting just allows to come into that middle way yeah. more easily and where there's a lot more possibility to be and potential to be tapped into in that middle way. And it's a, da- it's a dance for me. Like, and this is oh, where yeah. the work of say the meditation to increase our level of conscious awareness so I can bring conscious awareness into where is the best place for me to be on that spectrum for this specific circumstance that's happening in my life now at this specific time in my life with the specific resources or whatever. Like there's that spectrum and there's this dance and it's like our level of consciousness that allows us to like see a broader perspective so we can see whether uh, maybe I need to put a little bit more energy into this. Maybe I need to steer this thing here. Maybe I need to say yes to this thing. Um, the thought that came up for me when you were talking about the clients you work with too, Chan, is we can get these things, like we can achieve these things, but, you know, the force way is more likely to have um, consequences that aren't necessarily supportive so it might be an impact a negative impact in our relationships it might be a negative mm-hmm. impact on ourselves it might make us like really grumpy and not fun to be around like yeah. we might be way too intense and you know so yes you can achieve those by doing the grunt method like it's that's done by lots of people lots of time and people do achieve these things what we're suggesting is there might be a better way to do these things and let's step back and like let's look at what are the resources available to allow us to have this same experience or better like Sharon was saying and in a more easeful joyful life expanding growing learning sort of way Yeah. There's a great quote that I use from Mark Allen often. I I also add this to the end of goals or my to-do list in an easy and relaxed manner and a healthy and positive way. Mm, Can all be done in an easy and relaxed manner and a healthy and positive way. In a healthy and positive way. Mm Mm-hmm. So one of the things for me to, um, in alignment with this, achieving the things we want to achieve, experiencing the experiences we want to achieve is the more we come in alignment, and that's where, you know, this work, this Joe Dispenza work, this deeper inner work is a thing that brings us more in alignment with not only self, but I believe more in alignment with universe we're source with divine whatever you know whatever your terminology is your vernacular is for that but when we come into alignment with self it automatically or feels like it brings us more in alignment with this other life force that is around us and that's when we're more likely to have those synchronicity experiences like I worked less over the last couple of years, 2020, 2021, sort of just opened a lot of space, worked with less clients and that sort of stuff. And I had some awesome opportunities come up, you know, last year that are starting to now manifest into, you know, form. I'm involved in a beautiful business here in Bali, which is opening in a few weeks, which is a digital content creation studio and event space and social club like it's you know world-class recording facilities like it's just an amazing thing and it was just you know doing the inner work on myself and like you know just being in the zone that allowed me to have those connections 
in those synchronicities. I'm involved in an app project, which again, you know, I work with a former client. She, I work with her to go through to world titles in water skiing and that sort of thing. Amazing woman, and she's decided she wants to pivot and create this um, app project, which is focused on wealth, health, and happiness. So she said, you know, can you come in and handle the happiness component of it? I'm like, fantastic, I love it. And it's like, you know, a few hours of content generation per month, and, you know, like it's a, an amazing opportunity of service, and it's an amazing opportunity of abundance uh, for myself so what's your take on the alignment with self the alignment with uh, the unknown beyond like where are you at with that these days and your conversation with your clients yeah there's there is a higher power whatever we want to call it there's an inner knowing there's jesus there's god there's the universe whatever you want to call it, there is the ether, the plasma, the information, the energy fields that are scientifically flowing around us at all times. And then we've got our reticular activating system just above the brainstem. And this is what filters the information that's coming to us. And this is filtered by the programs that we subscribe to, that we have from growing up with the parents and the family we grow up in, the neighborhood we grow up in, the community, the schooling, society, the peers, the field of work we go into. This is the filters that get placed in there. And then this is the limited amount of information that comes to us and what it looks like and how we perceive the world. And so we think that that's all there is, mm -hmm. but there's so much more out there. And if we're able to examine our programs, our filters, and perhaps see what if this isn't it, we can just go with curiosity. Let, let me drop that one for a week and see what life looks like, see what mm -hmm. opens up, see what comes. And when I'm talking about higher power, more information, that's part of it. It's not this like mystery. It's just a, a way of looking at, like, I've become fixed in certain ways. What if I unfixed myself from that for just a while and mm -hmm. saw what else is out there? Um, and then, and then like, there are, I think you were the first one to talk to me about thinking and thoughting. Yeah. And I, I made up word and, thoughting. Yeah. Yeah. There's this, uh, if we really just stop and contemplate though and go, whose thoughts are these? Mm. Where do they come from? What, like, I think that I thought this thought, but did I think it or did it come to me? Did I have a thought? What's really going on here? And then as Dr. Joe talks about, we think the same 95% of the thoughts we think today are the same thoughts we thought yeah. the day before and the day before the day before. Yeah. But if we open ourselves to open-ended questions and contemplate more, like, that's another thing I got from this retreat last weekend is, what would it feel like to open my heart even more? Or what would it feel like to allow even more love into my mm. being? Mm. And just sit and be with that. I mean, you can ask any kind of question that's open-ended and just see what information comes. And it's all right there. But when we're fixed on this is the way to do it or this is the solution, um, we're limiting ourselves from that higher power, from that greater intelligence that's around us all the time. And those are just two simple ways of, of looking at it that are practical and anybody can do in this moment. Just looking at what your belief systems and patterns are and asking open-ended questions to contemplate. Yeah. And in that conversation around power versus force, if we're you know, using force as our principal fuel source, we're probably going pretty hard and you know we need to show up in lots of time. And we don't have much space. So part of the work as well as creating space so you can have those reflective experiences and slow down enough to go you know where did that belief or thought or narrative or story come from and asking questions like does it serve me asking questions you know you can go down the Boren Katie path of the work is it true even like this story and is it relevant for me now? It might have been relevant 12 months ago. Right. Is it still relevant? So this idea of, I'm a big fan of evolution, the idea of like 
what's still serving us? And is this still serving us? You know, is this belief or story or narrative from 12 months ago still serving me or do I need to upgrade it? Do I need to actually put an intention of what I do want? And, you know, could I broaden that up? So again, this stuff doesn't happen when we're living a lifestyle of force where we're like thinking that we need to do things, you know, one after the other after the other. And society is supportive of a pretty hectic, non-thinking, low-conscious, (laughs) over-consuming sort of thing, like, you know, the marketing mechanisms and machines are like pushing us to just consume. Don't think this stuff through. Like, you know, here's, you know, let me just give you some news and, you know, feed it down to you. Let me just, like, just be a consumer rather than, like, stepping back having a look around us, you know, what's working in my environment, what's not working in my environment. And again, this stuff requires slowing down. So slowing down, like one of the the best tools that we could say, you know, for ourselves, for our physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, psychological well-being is to slow down so that we can actually see and experience that which is around us what's that bring up for you Sharon after my little (laughs) riff there something that came to me years ago that I implemented in life was the motto no rushing and I usually like to have things in the positive sense but this one really works for me no rushing there's no need to rush everything is happening in divine time and I, particularly this would happen when I was in Bali and I would want to go to a yoga class and I would get caught up in something else. And I realized like, I'm going to have to rush to get there. And I would just let it be and say, if I need to rush, then I'm just not going to go. Mm-hmm. And eventually then my lifestyle and my new sense of time caught up. And since this was a rule I made for myself, a new mm-hmm. habit I was living into, it, I didn't want to miss yoga. So, so I would let life flow in a way so that I had plenty of time to get to yoga in an easy and relaxed manner mm-hmm. in a healthy and positive way. And I also realized that, you know, life has its own reasons and timelines. If I'm running late to something and it's beyond my control, like I left in plenty of time and I hit traffic, then I can calm myself down. There's no rushing. I'm getting there at the perfect time. There's Mm. some reason that this is all happening and I don't need to be flustered. I don't need to make a ton of excuses. I don't need to point fingers and blame whoever was clogging up the roads. And I just have lived into this way of no rushing. I sit for 15, 20 minutes after a meal, let my body digest. Mm. And I've watched friends and people be with me over the years that sit there and they're they're ready to go immediately. And they can't understand Like it makes them feel anxious that I'm sitting there in patience. And then over the years, they come back. Wow. Now I do this too. Mm. Like I watched your life. I watched your way of being and something in me adjusted to that as well. And it just so happens that more things get done. I'm more in that flow of life. I'm in the power rather than forcing. And, and I'm in, I'm enjoying, I'm tapping in to this greater power because I'm not going too fast that I'm missing it. Yeah. I've had to do some unprogramming from 14 years in the military where it was about (laughs) sense of urgency and concurrent activities and all of that sort of stuff. And, like, you know, I remember when we first started our officer training, like, you would have, like, five minutes to eat breakfast So you would get whatever food you could shovel in the quickest and you would just be rushing. So there was so much of that like rushing thing going on. So it's taken me years and I'm still unpacking it now because when I go unconscious, when I get distracted with something, I can bring that intensity and clean my teeth really fast. I'm like, what the hell am I cleaning my teeth so fast? Like what's the rush? So I like that and I I like the distinction you made because – 
you know, sometimes we're told, you know, always state things in the positive, you know, don't say what you don't want to do and that sort of thing. But with most things in life, there's guidelines, but, you know, so much <laughs> of what we talk about isn't chiseled in stone, isn't absolute. Yes, this might be the way to do it, but I like the idea if something resonates for you, doesn't matter whether it's this way, that way, or up or down, or someone says you shouldn't do it like that or whatever. If that resonates and causes a personal effect with you that is a positive personal effect, it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if, you know, standing on one foot, holding your ear, shaking it around, sticking your finger up your right nostril causes you to come back into a deeply relaxed state. If that's your jam, <laughs> that's your jam. So part of our work too is like helping people identify what's working for them, what's not working for them. So certain beliefs might actually serve someone, one person really well, and they might be disruptive for another person. So this is right. the dance of life is for me is like working out, you know, what is most relevant for me. If I bring it into a business context, you know, in, an, in the entrepreneurial space, it might be, Someone's selling a marketing program and they're like, this is the way to do it. And very rigid about it. And it might actually work for about 5% of people or 10% who are actually in alignment with the beliefs and the, the, the world view of that person. So it is in alignment and works for those. But for 90% of the people, it might just be out of alignment with all the other bits of who they are. So trying to force this thing, you know, back to that force thing, you know, is not right for them. So again, it's, you know, this slowing down things, no rushing, bringing it back and trying to understand over the course of our life, you know, free of other people telling us what, like what works for me? Like, you know, that's a, such a big piece. I'm just looking at the time and we might wrap this up pretty soon it's been a nice little conversation and i felt like our last conversation with sharon was a bit rushed and we were like i was trying to fit too many things in that so it's interesting that the last point we have is we've had this second conversation <laughs> and we're sort of finishing on this idea of no rushing so i love some of the distinctions sharon made about tracking your gains and that's really valuable to know where you're at and that you've actually made progress along the way and sometimes journaling can be good to record these things so you can actually see go back oh yeah i have come a long way i used to be really reactive in this particular situation setting now i'm not so reactive i can see that and again <laughs> joe dispenses work deep meditative work you know this inner work that allows us the space to like dance with these things differently um at the end of your goals like you know whatever goals and acknowledging you only know what you know and you don't know what you don't know so this idea of on the end of your goals or something even better acknowledging it might come in a different form and you know one of the things with force like if we're forcing ourselves to see something needing to be a particular way in our own mind's eye and something even better comes along but it looks different you know, we may miss that thing if we tell ourselves that it has to be exactly a green car and, you know, a yellow Lamborghini, you know, is off on the side there, which is available to us. But no, I wanted, I saw it as a green car, so I'm just only noticing green. Um, and that other one was easy and relaxed manner in a, what's that, healthy? Healthy. And healthy and positive yeah. way. Mm -hmm. So this idea of like softening into life, so life isn't a force and a struggle. Life is more about letting this power flow through us and redefine us and change our personality. And as Joe says, that changing our personal personality changes our personal reality. You know, what we experience of life outside of ourselves as a result of that. So a beautiful conversation with Sharon. Sharon, have you got any last pieces to add with that, to that? I had plenty. <laughs> um, <laughs> we might have to do a part three. Um, yes, I, I I recently discovered this series of books. Have oh, you yeah, yeah, read? Yeah. 
the don't set the small set. Yeah. This is from 1997. I'm a little bit behind the times. Yeah. Um, but one of the things you're just speaking about the one of the first things he says in here is let go of the idea that gentle, relaxed people can't be super achievers. Mm. And that sums up a lot of what we've been pointing to today. And this book has a hundred of those things which are covered in one to three pages each. And they're really digestible, really practical. And you can pick up a book like this and take on one a day or one a week and see how your life changes from, from doing this. And there's several in the series. This is actually the one that I got first, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff in Love. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Um, there's don't sweat the small stuff about money. There's don't sweat the small stuff about work. There's a lot of really practical, Fantastic. easily consumable information in these books as well. Cool. I'll put those in the show notes as well, the yeah. recommendation for that. <sighs> okay. We'll, we'll talk about a part three in the not too distant future. We'll think about where we go on that conversation piece and we'll ask around as well if there's some specific topics that people want us to, to dig into and delve around. I mean, I love answering questions and I love, you know, making it as relevant as possible for people yes. in that answering questions that apply to those. So more to come. So again, thank you so much, Sharon, for joining me for this Life Masterclass podcast series. Um, if you've enjoyed listening to this conversation, like um, do sign up for my newsletter as well because there's blending between my podcasts and my um, newsletters as well and say so tuned in to me there uh, and if you enjoy this please uh, feel free to share it I'll be very grateful and there might be some little distinction in here that's just right for someone that you pass it to so serve them in a beautiful way so thank you once again Sharon have a fantastic day enjoy the golfing over there in Florida and I look thank forward you. to talking to you soon take care yes Thanks, Carl. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. See you later. Ciao, ciao. Oh, I forgot to finish. Like, no, I'm not going to ciao, ciao it out because I normally finish with wherever you are on this amazing, beautiful, gorgeous, incredible planet of ours, all the very best and take care. Now I can go. See you later, everyone. <laughs>